From composer to recording engineer to graphic designer and marketing professional, I mean, I've talked on the show before about how we production music folks tend to have a lot of irons in the fire, and I really can't think of a leader in our industry who best embodies this than John Meyer, whose music and YouTube channel is a constant source of inspiration for me. Well, John has just released his brand new contact instrument, Soft Drums, and I wanted to have him on the show to not only talk about that, but also to share how he balances his many creative outlets from music making to sample making to filmmaking. So join me as I welcome John Meyer to this week's episode of the 52 Q's podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Q's podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by a member of the 52 Q's community, and this week, we're gonna be taking a listen to a chill lo-fi cue written by Harley Toberman, so definitely wanna stick around for that. If this is your first time here, welcome, you know, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio podcast in the go, you know, I just want to thank you for spending a small part of your day here with me. I also want to give a huge word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Qs who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything here going. We are 100% community supported, so you know, you're not going to hear any ads for mattresses or meal plans, but if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52 Qs and also unlock extra perks like live streams, workshops, Zoom feedback sessions, and a ton more, then be sure to click on the links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking all about that a little bit later in today's episode. Uh, you know, there are a handful of YouTubers that I subscribe to that not only get the notification, but they get like the every notification, meaning that whatever they put out, I am going to stop what I'm doing and pay attention because I always come away learning something. And John Meyer is one of those people. So uh, I was really thrilled to not only meet him last year at the Production Music Conference, but when he agreed to join me here on the channel. So here is my recent interview with John Meyer. You know, it's not every day that you get to chat with one of your uh, your YouTube heroes. And I Ugh. am here. <laughs> I am here with the great John Meyer. John, how are you doing, my man? I am good. It is great to be here with you as well. We, yeah. We, uh, we actually got to meet in person at, at one point. Yeah. At the PMC last year, you plan on going again this year? Absolutely. Yeah. That's that's That gets marked on the calendar as soon as they announce the dates. Yeah. 100%. I am planning on going as well. That was my first uh, the conference. By the way, listeners, this is a production music conference in LA. It was my first time in LA and like... 35 years and uh, really enjoyed hanging out with you. And I appreciate you having me on your channel. Yeah. So uh, really appreciate that, man. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. And and we've been kind of uh, looking to connect for a while now because, man, I absolutely love what you do. I, I love it is who you are just as a, as a person, as a human, right? As a, a composer, as a, as a business person, you make your own samples. You are the executive director of Merge Music, you know, running a production music label and all of this. And so I, I like to, I like to tell my students and my, my listeners that I'm just a future version of them. Well, I, I feel like you're a future version of me, even though I, I, I think I probably got a few years on you, but time is nonlinear. Yes, you know, when it comes yes. to these types of things. But I just want to start off just by saying how much I appreciate you and I appreciate what you do out there in the YouTube space. And um, you do it with kindness and compassion and uh, putting good energy out into the universe. And e even though, you know, we have our fair share of wagging our finger at, at waves or whatever, yes. you know, other sample libraries. In my next video, I, I mentioned waves and I thought, oh, no. What am I doing? So I may have to bleep it out or do something. <laughs> You're doing it for the clicks, man. You're doing it for the clicks. If it bleeds, it leads, right? Yes, yes. But uh, John, man, how are you? Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I'm I'm great. This is an, an honor to talk to you and to talk to uh, all the people at 52Qs. It's such a cool thing you've got going on. And Thank you. Yeah, we uh, 
we've joked about this, how our, you just said it right before we got on, our Venn diagram <laughs> is not really a Venn diagram. It's probably right. the exact same people. So yeah, the uh, Venn diagram of your viewers and my viewers is practically a circle. I, would yes. I, I hope so. If, if you're watching this right now and you have not subscribed to his channel, stop this video. I'm okay with that. I'm okay. If you stop <laughs> with this video, jump onto his channel. Of course, we're going to have links and everything in the description, but go subscribe to this guy because not only is he dropping wisdom like it's, you know, like it's going out of style. He is immensely talented and the videos are good. I mean, they're just, they're just good. And Thank so you. tell me a little bit about where like filmmaker John ends and composer John begins, or is it just one big blurry gradient of creativity? It's a big mess and it just happened. Uh, and I can tell you kind of how I, got into this is it was very clear. I had always, my dad had cameras around and I always messed with them. And I got a T3i probably eight years ago, which was Canon's DSLR. And I, I do some stuff at my church, but it's a small church and we don't have any kind of budget. So I'd, I'd always be the one to film. And I got a little bit better at it as I went, but I, I made an album called paper trail and it was an instrumental project that I released. It's like a, you know, um, What's the word we use for modern classical, contemporary classical? Like neoclassical? You know? Yeah. Or? See, there's like five words and none of right, them really, yeah. really <laughs> explain what it is. And so, but I watched a bunch of videos at the time. This is probably five years ago. And they were all, you know, out of focus trees and streams. And I thought, what if I could kind of tell a little story to go along, to make these videos, to go along with it? And I just got hooked. And started making, made this little story with my nephew and my dad had a drone and I learned how to use the drone. And then that led to making YouTube videos, ma mainly uh, Christian Henson, Spitfire Audio shared mm -hmm. a bunch of my work and sent a bunch of people my way immediately. So it was just an obvious, it was not anything that I planned. It just kind of happened. And then I realized how much I love all of it. Like I, I love music. But I think I love stories more mm. and music is, especially production music, you're telling all these different types of stories all the time. You know, like we're writing parts of these stories that we have no idea what they're going to be most of the time or how they're going to be used. But to me, it just all weaved together and now I can't separate it. And so YouTube is the obvious place to kind of. You know, and so it's so much like production music, and it's what I tell people all the time is like, whatever you're good at at the moment, you can write a good production music track. Now, you might be limited to that thing, mm -hmm. but you can write a good one there, and then you can learn something else, and you can write a good one there, and you can learn something else, and then suddenly you're pulling from all these inspirations, and that's that's what YouTube affords is the the ability to put it out there, make something, and some people will see through the mistakes and they'll connect with you and then hopefully you can get better and go. And uh, so that's a long answer for what you said. But no, it's, no, it's, it's fascinating. And I am, I'm so uh, just in awe of your, your editing chops, you know, and your storytelling. I love the way you put that. Your videos are such a different approach to the entire process than mine. And, and I think it's, the filmmaker approach to educational videos versus kind of like the classroom lecturer approach. Yes. And um, things are going to resonate with different people. And so I, I've, I've personally like not chased the algorithm and I've not gone in and done a bunch of like smash cuts and, and learning. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me, but that's not in my DNA. That feels like life draining to go in and do that kind of editing minutia. <sighs> It can be, and there are certainly moments where I think, "What is it that I'm doing? What am I doing?" <laughs> and I'm and I'm always trying to figure out. You know, someone said to me, "You know, YouTube is for YouTube videos, and YouTube videos work on YouTube, and you need to figure out what YouTube videos are." Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not feature films, it's it's something different, and it's always changing, and you you can get sucked into, uh, you can get sucked into the algorithm and and all those little things, but at the same time. Sto good stories are good stories, and there's a reason why. Uh, you know, there's just so there's just so many connections between YouTube and production music. I can't say that enough. Yeah, 
because they're little short things that go out there and they're not, they're, they're each contained individually and you're, you're learning in some ways you're kind of separating yourself from the art, but you're also part of the art. Yeah. Um, you're, ha- you're having to, uh, I mean, at some level you're having to take the usage into consideration. You're having to take, you know, it's one thing to make a bunch of videos, and if you're just doing that and you don't literally don't care how many people watch, then I think mm-hmm. that's one thing. But if you're making videos that are trying to reach people, then you have to reach them where they're at. You have to manage their expectations and and, and meet them where they're at. And you're right, in production music, we do that. I think there are gradations of that, you mm-hmm. know, like the the super stylized storytelling type of videos that you make, which are chef's kiss you buddy you are on my notifications all <laughs> it goes right to it it shows up i r- watch it right away um whereas like in my my form they're like hour long videos uh because i find myself as a learner benefiting from both sides oh, yeah. uh and so uh wh- while i might spend 2 hours recording a session and doing little editing you know you might spend two hours recording shorter sessions and then spend more time editing and all of that. I just, I just want to start just by saying that uh, I just really appreciate your your videos and and um, and your approach to all of that and and seeing the kind of the Christian Henson connection. Mm-hmm. I could absolutely see that. I see you guys are both cut from very similar cloths. Uh, just you know, <laughs> ones out in the UK and, and yeah. here in the US. Um, so t- uh, let's let's roll back a little bit further. I love asking people's journey into production music mm-hmm. um, because you know we get in our head that this is the one way if you don't go to school or if you don't go to LA or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I know for a fact there are so many different paths to this career, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your path to production music. Yeah, well, I went to college in, at Texas A and M. Didn't stu- I studied? They had a music minor at the time, but I, it wasn't on the radar. I got into, uh, but I started working with a guy who had a little recording studio, and then out of college, I interned at a recording studio, and I also did like acoustic finger style instrumental. I made an album back in ninety nine or two thousand, and what was funny is that was passed on by my professor to a guy who I've later found out owned Omni Music. <laughs> Yeah, like I didn't know that what that meant, right. and he even wrote back to me, and it was, um, do you know the name? He's on the uh, board. He's on the PM uh, the ASCAP board, or at least uh, Wood was his last name. Okay. And, anyways, but I didn't follow up on it, and it was a stupid mistake. But so I got into engineering. I wanted to be a recording engineer, and then after a while, I realized that I kind of like producing records. And and again, this is early 2000s. So there's still, I think somebody coming in right now with like, what are you talking about? Like we just, you just do it all. <laughs> but it was still very, very segmented. And I yeah. felt like there was some pressure to choose what I wanted to do. And here I am like, just to, to this very day, well, I like to do it all. Right. So I would learn how to produce. And then I had a buddy come in who we were producing this album and this girl had some songs and she was a great singer and the songs were okay, but he sat back and he messed with those songs. And then at the end of the day, they were 10 times better. And I knew they were better, but I had no idea what he had done. And I was very down on myself. I thought, mm. I can't do that. So I decided, well, I'm going to start writing songs. And I kind of had a little folk career. I don't want to call it that. I mean, I played coffee shops and did a few gigs and, (laughs) but that helped me learn how to write songs. And then all those years of, you know, somebody coming to me and said, Hey, can you record my song? I've got $300. I'd be like, okay, yeah. And so we'd work on it and I'd have to add all the instruments. So I used reason or whatever it is I had at the time to add keys and learn how to fake my way through all of that. And just kind of realized that I remember having this epiphany that I could name 10 people in my circle that were better at every single thing that I was doing, but I couldn't name as many people that were better than me at all of it, Mm. you know, and like I could have a conversation about this. I could squeak my way through it. And then I got the opportunity. I met a guy who owned the library that I still work for this day, who 
is a funny story. And if people have watched my channel, I've told it many times, but I think it's super important is that I made this album that I called Moody Grooves. And it was full of like 20 snippets of songs that I thought were production music. And I wrote royalty free music. I had a cover made for it. And I gave it to this guy and he was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And he wrote me an email about all the ways that these songs might work, but really how they're not really working in their current state. So it was discouraging, but also very encouraging. But at the end of the email, he goes, but on the way out the door, you handed me your personal singer-songwriter album. And we had a mutual friend that made the connection, and he was a producer. And so my library friend thought that that guy had produced it, only to realize that I had produced it. And he was like, why didn't you give this to me first? <laughs> and my thought was, this is folk singer, songwriter, 29-year-old, 28-year-old John, who's can't get the girls to go out with them and, you know, that kind of stuff. And he was like, this is so much better and it's so much more detailed and it's so much more about, I can see you in this. So he said, what if we make an album? It takes these elements from that and we start there. Hmm. And that led to another album and another album. And one thing that I'm so grateful for is that he would always push me into territory that I wasn't familiar, you know, and, and that he could, obviously I had understanding, but okay, we want you to do a trailer type sound or an elegant piano type sound. And yeah, so that's kind of how I fell into it, and then just kept making albums and making albums, and then I, I just I, I I paused and I wrote eight albums worth of material, went to NAB at the time, which was where the production music people used to gather, and pitched it, and that ended up becoming Merge at the with the same gotcha. library that I typically work work uh, for, and so. That's kind of it. I mean, there was a, there was a time period in there where I kind of had a bit of a crisis of, you know, I wasn't making the kind of, I realized that producing local bands in Dallas wasn't a long-term deal for me. You know, you really have to go to shows and yeah, play music. Yeah, you have to hustle, with, man. <laughs> and I, I met uh, my wife, uh, who also had a child at the time. And so I'm like becoming a husband and a father. And so I started working. I started teaching at a um, a production school. Mm -hmm. No business doing that whatsoever, and I was terrible <laughs> at it. But I learned. You know, we we have a similar background there. I like. I just learned how to do it, and then now that part of it surprisingly is a big part of the yeah. YouTube thing. So I guess the point is, none of this was planned. It was just follow this lead, follow this lead, follow this lead, and then. Uh, see where it goes. Yeah, you know, I think it's 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 interesting that a library or publisher kind of tapped into you know what what I've heard other publishers call your core competence. Like, mm, what's the great. thing that is core? Not that you can't build upon it, but there's probably like one or two things that just flow out of your muse. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And um, yeah, be, being able to find somebody who can tap into that and then help you develop it as yeah. you build around it, uh, I think is is vital. And I know that's that's one of the things that we work on at Fifty Two Qs in, in helping folks kind of find that. It's not that you know when, when at, at the PMC, I remember during one of the sessions, some of the uh, music supervisors were asked like, "What's the what what type of library music sells the most right and they said the good kind <laughs> yeah <laughs> right it's not like hip hop dramedy and it's not you know tension with pulsing ticks and all of that it's the kind that is so well done because mm -hmm. it comes out of a place of of your core competence and so having having somebody in your life be that catalyst i think is is vital and yeah. so that's great i was very fortunate very fortunate to have that because I didn't know what I was good at. You know, yeah. I, I tried to do a lot of things and I think I'm good at this, but to have somebody be like, you're good. This is okay, but this is really where you shine. There's something special. And I didn't see that. 
You yeah, know, let, I didn't see that in myself. Yeah, let's find an outlet for that thing as opposed to put that uh, in a whole other silo by itself and then you yeah. try to learn how to write hip-hop beats or, or whatever yeah. the things are far away from your core competence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and that kind of, you know, as production music composers, we know that it takes generally a lot of music, a lot of mm. output, you know, and we've talked quality versus quantity here on the channel before, but, you know, you have to have a lot of little, a lot of lines in the, in the, in the pond in order to get nibbles and to get, you know, fishing metaphor. Mm -hmm. But um, that doesn't mean that you have to go be all things to all people. And I think mm -hmm. at least don't start there. Cause I don't think libraries are looking for that. Do you, they're not looking for Swiss army knife people. They want people that, have one or two things that they are just amazing at. Yeah, I I think that's that's true. I mean, I also like to work with people and kind of help develop them and kind of do some of the things that were done for me, you mm -hmm. know, and say and and go a little bit wider. But yeah, you always start with what they their bread and butter yeah. and and then try to build off of that in ways that make sense. Because I do think you need to develop those skills that are outside of your main thing because you might find that you know you know this music is music and the instruments are uh that's just one part of it but the yeah. way music works and makes you feel doesn't matter if it's a metal track or a folk track i mean it's right. <laughs> th there, there are there are threads that weave in 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 there so yeah yeah it's kind of a little bit of both um but definitely there is an authenticity to the thing that you do the best. And that, yeah. that speaks in a way that um, will make people want to be around it and be a part of it. Yeah. And I've found connective tissue between the things that I find myself doing. Like I wanted to be a film composer. So I, you know, in growing in school, did orchestra and all that, but I also kind of liked DJing and jazz. And so mm -hmm. getting into trip hop and acid jazz, and then that kind of, baked into merging orchestral side of things. And that became like epic orchestral hip hop. But then that became contemporary hip hop, which then, you know, gets into like UK drill and all this other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, going up the trailer side of things. And so for at least in, in my competencies, I can see the threads that are connecting, right? It's not like I sat down and went, I'm going to play banjo and then mm -hmm. go over here and I'm um, trying to find a style of music as removed from banjo i'm gonna go make dubstep right like the, there's not much connective tissue between yeah. that um and so and so yeah and so as you've uh, progressed forward in your career and uh, especially with merge have do you find yourself just really pouring your energy into uh, one or two libraries or do you have a lot of music seeded out to a lot of different publishers i do I only have my music with a handful of publishers. I started writing for Atomica uh, and 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 Merge, and I thought um, I was encouraged by the owner of the library to write for other libraries. I mean, he's that kind of friend yeah. and 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 mentor. He saw something in me that he he wanted me to have the best career possible. Uh, but you know, when I developed the catalog, it made more sense for me to focus on that, and and then so I. I am free to put music anywhere that I'd like, but I made, you know, my diversification is into other things like YouTube and film right. making. That's where I'm putting my other eggs. Whereas, you know, production music composers, I would always encourage them. And even those who work with me, I, I encourage them to seek out all opportunities because, you know, there are so many reasons why our music gets used that is out of our control yeah and you never know what's going to happen so the more you can put it in different places the better chance you have of 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 finding some sort of consistency and even though that is a, a whole topic for a video you know yeah absolutely. What, what production music taught me is that i need to be six months to nine months ahead in my own personal finances mm. uh and that was the first time that i had ever even been close to being more than a few weeks or a month ahead because yeah. you never know. And then you'll have a good time and you want to spend it on things and you're like, okay, no, it could be bad and then it could be great again. And, but it, it completely changed the way that I think about money. Um, just because 
you know, for the first time and, you know, having a family, I've got to be smarter about this. Yeah. You can't see like a big royalty check come in and then think, well, time for shopping trip, time for Guitar Center or, or Sam Ash or uh, I did. I did have a, an, ex- an exceptionally high performance check a few years ago, and I spent a lot of that on camera equipment. Yeah. And that, that has turned out to be very, very much worth the investment for me. And there are obvious times when you need to improve your gear and all that, but it just forces you to be smart about it. And yep. um, that's, a, yeah. that's a difficult thing to do to navigate the <laughs> yeah, plug-in. And I- and I'm not, I'm not doing it full time. I'm not a full time composer. You know, I teach, you know, full time at full sale. And so I, I haven't experienced that kind of, oh my gosh, six to nine months because, you know, you get the, the usual job, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the two week check and benefits and everything. And so I can absolutely appreciate it. And it reminds me of, I have a buddy who runs sound or does sound for, <laughs> TV shows, right? He's a boom operator. And it would be, you got to make hay, you know, while the sun shine, and then you just have to kind of nest it away yeah. for when the gigs dry up just a little bit. And mm-hmm. so you can kind of ride those. I, I want to talk about going into merge and going up into and, and beyond just the composer role and your role now on the other side. What are some things that you see from the publisher library side that you wish you could go tell you know, 28, 30 year old John or a listener out there, a viewer watching this kind of early in their career? Oh, um, it's just that even though I, I like to think that I understand what editors and, and videographers and the people that buy our music want, I still don't understand as much as I, as you know, when you're not doing it day to day. Now, YouTube has helped me understand a little bit more about what music works and what doesn't work. And to me, it's more of that everything is a shift to where will this be used? Who are the clients that are going to buy it and work backwards? Whereas when I first started, it was the kick drum goes here and the chords, this chord moves me this way. So I'm going to go with it. And then I, oh, I, let's do this crazy section where I change the, the meter and the tempo. And then we'll go. And you, and you realize that in most production music, it's about finding that very clear idea and finding ways to, sometimes you want it to build if it's a building track. But a lot of times you just want it to uh, to kind of stay there and give an editor an option to stay with it as long as they as they can until they have to move on. So I think that is the biggest difference is just a, a little bit more of an understanding of what exactly it is we are doing here. And it's not just about writing great music. It's about writing music that works for um, those kind of scenarios and the long game of it. You know, I, I go yeah. over and over when I work with new people, I try to like almost just, you know, encourage them to not do this <laughs> because well, yeah, when you roll out the timeline, you know, from the, from you shipping off your cue to a, a library, you know, it's yeah. got to get ingested in their library. It might be what, three to six months before it actually gets published on their site in their catalog. And then it might be another three to six months before it finds their, their way into, uh, finds mm-hmm. its way onto a show, into a playlist. And then you're looking for another nine to 12 months before you actually get paid. So the thing that you delivered this morning, you might not actually see royalties yeah. for almost two years. And you're right. I did an audit of my, I have a, because I have to track stuff coming in and money going out. I have a fairly detailed database and I've got my just a simple top earning tracks and albums. And when I go through and I do my top earning albums, 2012, 2013, 2015, 2017. Maybe I got a big license from something in 2021, but then it's 2012. You know, and yeah. when I see that, I'm like, okay, these albums, if as long as I don't write a ton of 
I'm not the coolest guy in town. I don't know if you can tell that, <laughs> but I'm Aww. not. I'm not chasing the the trends so much. I mean, I'm. I try to, but you know, I try to always for everything that's sounds like 2023, whatever that sound is now, it's like <laughs> impossible to know. Uh, I want some. I want some things that are going to sound relatively timeless. Yeah, ever, evergreen cues. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And um, switching gears mm-hmm. because we've talked about filmmaker John. We've mm-hmm. talked about composer John. We've talked about publisher John. There is a fourth John, <laughs> and that is John, the sample maker. Yes. And you, you, as of this recording, you recently, just a couple of weeks ago, released Soft Drums. And I've got, as a drummer, you know, as a career drummer, got drums in the background of the shot. I've got to say, you completely knocked this out of the park. You crushed you. this live because it is everything that I, as a drummer composer, look, look for, looks for. Easy to use, not super fiddly and fussy. It sounds great out of the box, and it does exactly what it says, like <laughs> on the tin. Mm-hmm. And it's e- just it, you. It's usable. It sounds great. I don't mean to sound like a commercial. But I'm such a I'm such a fan of this library. Tell us a little bit first about uh, about soft drums, and then I want to hear more about your story of getting into making your own samples because yeah. of all the free time that you have. You know? <laughs> but tell us a little bit about soft drums. Well, soft drums was uh, originally one of my what I call prototypes, and it was on piano book, which I'm sure most of your audience are. What do you call them? And it's not your audience; it's your uh, community members. Your community yeah. members, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was a, a sound that I made after a session. My buddy Joel, who's he's all over my videos, he taught me everything, and we made this little simple. Uh, drums using broomsticks and tea towels over the drums and fluffy beaters. Yep. And I put it up uh, as a free sound and people loved it. It was kind of pretty compressed and kind of aggressive sounding. Uh, it was, and there was no control over it. You just played it. And so that led me to, uh, I knew that when I got into kind of pursuing this as, as an, a business, that that would be one that I would deep sample multiple drums uh, we've got multiple Ludwig kits and I'm not even sure what snares we ended up using. And, and also what I'm most proud or I'm proud about a lot of things, but, you know, making a lot of these free libraries along the way, uh, I got in touch with some guys that have helped me really kind of bring this to life and do the things that I can't do. Like, uh, if it was my GUI design, it would not look like that. <laughs> if it was my scripting, it would not perform the way it does. Yeah. And so they have a part of it that, and they really, it's been fun working with them to to kind of realize some of these things that are in my head, because I kind of got to the point where I realized I couldn't, didn't have the time to do all that. Right. Uh, but yeah, soft drums, um, it fits in the middle. You know, it's, there's something about the way the brushes hit the snare and the toms that they're full, but they're not. It's not a big crack on the snare. It's just kind of a, a sound that fits a lot of the music that I personally like mm-hmm. to create. It's not orchestral, but it's not a big drum kit. It's somewhere in the middle, and it just seems to fit in a lot of those styles that are close mics mm-hmm. and um, where you're adding your own ambience to it. And so, yeah, that's it. It's available for contact. It's the full version, which... I'm sorry to people that don't have. That's a that's a big issue. Uh, well, well, well. If, in case you don't know, uh, the reason it requires the full version of Contact is because in order for it to run off the free player, you have to like pay a licensing fee, right? To native. Yes, instruments? and it's 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 pretty substantial yeah. for <laughs> someone like myself. It's not out of the re- like. Do I regret? Maybe maybe I'll do it one day with soft drums or the next instrument. Uh, because I know that would open me up to more people, and I know there are people that don't don't have contact, can't afford it, and I understand. But my argument is that there are a lot of developers like myself that would benefit, and you would benefit from if you just bought contact and find it when it's on sale or whatever. Uh, and I may make a video about that in the future, just kind of addressing some of these reasons why. Because 
it allows uh, us so much power inside with the scripting and with, 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 with what is there that in order for us to recreate it in a different sampler or some people are like, why don't you just make your own plugin? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that, make yeah, it, that, make that, it that work would, in Cubase and, and uh, oh, no. Okay. That would be more expensive than just paying Native Instruments the license. Absolutely. Licensing. So yeah. there's that. Um, but to answer the other part of the question, how did I get into sampling? Well, uh, uh, Christian Henson made this channel back in the day and he put it out to p- the, the piano book thing. And I I had a flute, a Native American. Uh, Native American or indigenous persons. I'm not exactly sure how to describe it, but mm-hmm. it was made by my my brother-in-law's father. And then I had a student violin and I put those two things together and it magically became something that people really connected to. And it was just an accident because I have made samples after that that were not near as good. <laughs> So this one just worked and I put reverb on it and I shaped it the way that I liked it. And that sound really took off. And I made videos to go along with it. And I think that at the time, Christian was trying to teach everybody this stuff. And here I am, this guy in Dallas, Texas, thousand miles away from him, kind of took his advice, created this thing and shared it. So he was proud of that. And he Mm -hmm. shared it and amongst me and a few other people. And so I just got the bug and started making more and gave all of them away. Uh, as part of the plat- uh, the the um, piano book community and my own website, and then when I started making YouTube videos, uh, it was, you know, I've got if YouTube doesn't just give you thousands and thousands of dollars when you sign up, you know, you've got to. <laughs> they don't. Uh, you didn't get no. that check. Oh man! I'm... <laughs> so I realized that that what might be a way that I could make some money, and also in in in. in it, I might wear people out with drum videos this week or this month, but it gives me so many opportunities to also teach my methods of the way I approach drums, the way I program drums, the way I mix drums, which is my next video coming out, you know, some methods that I use. And so for me, it's a way to hopefully make some money, but also it locks so close into my channel and it makes sense. And I don't have to sell something that, yeah, doesn't you, you, make sense. Yeah, your video on you know creating realistic drum programming. You know, I I'm sure you heard me all the way in Texas. I was like, yes, don't come at me with an eight arm drummer, right? You have one one hand, you have a right hand, left hand, right foot, and a left foot. Well, I'm you glad. said when I when you said when I crash, I lift off the hi hat because a drummer would do that. I'm like, absolutely. Well, I'm hoping. I was worried about that video. It seems to be it seems to be re- been. Re- it's received well from what I can tell, but Mm -hmm. there's a lot of me talking about this before you even get to this, because that's so important. Like everything that we do in production music, and it's the same way with my YouTube videos. Now I used to just talk into the front of the camera and edit. And now I write an outline, a script. I know what my thumbnail and title are probably going to look like. And when I am making a production music track, I am researching and thinking of building little templates maybe of what sounds I might use before I do anything because you realize how important the 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 thinking is mm-hmm. over the doing. And so there's a lot of big talk in that about, you know, this doesn't work or we think about this. And I even cut the part about let's talk about drum kit. Let's talk about how the shells affect the sound. Let's talk mm-hmm. about the all the different heads all the different sticks you can use, all of those go into it. And if you make those choices and then, you know, people get frustrated. Like it's art, man. I can do whatever I want. And I'm like, yes, yeah, yeah. but you need to understand where you fall, what kind of sounds you're trying to make. And if you miss on purpose, that's different than missing when you're trying to replicate a certain vibe from a certain sound. That's right. And not, not to mention that, if if you want to make something, it's art, and you do what you do, right? That's cool, but just then, then that, no nobody is uh, obligated to give you money for it. Right? Exactly. And don't. Yeah, you can't then complain that no one gets you. Right, because if, if yeah, and that's artisan brain. That's what I talk about, you know, on the channel all the time is thinking like an artisan and less like an artist. 
And, uh, and so, yeah, but so you haven't, you have, I know, I know you work in contact. You haven't tried like decent sampler and sound paint and, or even like stock logic or Ableton samplers. Have you piddled around with those? Just one second. I feel like, I think I made the alarm go off in my rental okay. car. Right, I'm going to uh, <laughs> click here. Um, well, yes, there are decent sampler versions of most of my prototypes that are on the website. Uh, huge fan of David Hillowitz and all mm-hmm. that he's done. He's become a good friend. His stuff is uh, fantastic. Um, I haven't messed with any other, and it's mostly just because of it's like everything I can do to just get these done. Mm. And in fact, most of the decent sampler, a guy named Kyle from the piano book community took those and ported them over. And uh, for most things, especially the smaller instruments, it's it's perfect. When you get into the higher level graphics and some of the, the deeper scripting, um, that's where it's a little different. So if I were to make another version of soft drums in one of those platforms, it wouldn't quite sound the same. And that would be, uh, that would be a struggle for me to sell it and have two versions of it that didn't quite perform and sound the same way. But, um, yeah. Yeah. It is, it's to your knowledge. Is there any, any sampler out there that is, isn't, you know, bespoke to a specific, you know, like, like, uh, to my knowledge, Spitfire isn't, you know, leasing or licensing their sampler engine to anything that's not no, specifically yeah. Spitfire. Do you know of any other sample engine that can kind of rival the deep scripting that contact can do? I am not aware, and I think you hit on the point that most of the companies that are up in that next level, uh, they have to be quite, they have to have a pretty significant amount of money to then develop their own uh, platform, their own plugin, because, you know, you've got it now, you've got to make sure it works everywhere. And you hear people all the time griping about Spitfire's plugin or whatever. I mean, I think it's fine. It, It works great, but you hear people complaining and they're complaining because that team has to deal with so many <laughs> things that change all the time. And when you are a developer with contacts, all you've got to worry about is every couple of years, they're going to give you a, another number, which makes people mad that they have to upgrade to that. <laughs> but it's still just, it's all contained right yeah. there. So, and you're standing on the decades of development that have gone into yeah. contact. And, and I understand why they do their licensing platform for their full player. I get it all. It is confusing. Like, unfortunately, uh, I don't tell if don't tell your people this, but uh, I, I don't say I'll give refunds. But if people write to me and they're like, "Look, I, I really thought it was for the free player, even though I try to go overboard," I've only had to give two refunds this go around, which is which is much better than I've done in the past. So, yeah, I always send people to. Uh, are you familiar with Westwood Instruments? No, uh. Uh-uh. Rob, he runs Westwood and he's a fantastic guy. And he has this great, uh, this is how bad at business I am. You know, he has this great PDF on his, or this section on his website about contact. So when people ask questions about it, I say, go to Rob's page and buy samples while you're there. But he has a great explanation of, okay, this is what you have. This is what you need. You think you have this. If it says demo, we don't sell demos. So anyway, yeah. that's a, you know, and I mean, at the end of the day, it, it helps you produce a library, which is cheaper. I mean, absolutely. Like yeah. you don't have to pay the, the licensing fee to native instruments. So, mm-hmm. so you are able to give it at a price that isn't, you know, like 500 bucks or, or yeah. something like that. As of, as of right now, what is the price on soft to, uh, soft it's, drums? It's on sale until the end of the month for $59 and it will go up to 79. Okay. That is at the end of April or is that the end of May? End of April. So, okay. All right. Yeah. So by, t- yeah, by the time we hear this, that might have been. Uh, okay. But I plan been. on um, releasing other instruments and we'll, have sales and such. I know that I know that m- a good chunk of people buy things when they're on sale because the sales sure. are usually pretty good in this this uh, this world that we live in of, <laughs> of instruments and plugins and such. Because yeah. everybody everybody knows kind of that's how the I, game I, works. I predict a whole like Black Friday, Black Month, Black November email blitz. Right? You got you're you're there. You're there now, right? I know. You've got to do all I that know. business. I'm now. like, oh, I'm sending another email. They're gonna hate me, but oh. you know. They can unsubscribe. I mean, <laughs> if, if, yeah, that, for sure. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Well, like like I said before, we got started recording. There are a handful of drum libraries that I keep dipping back into because of their usability, and mm-hmm. Soft Drums is one of their right right up there with like Get Good Drums, One Kit Wonders. Right, you're not gonna necessarily like. It's not the it's not the drum library that you're going to put on everything, mm-hmm. right? It's just not the right fit, and it's it's not super fiddly, you know. And some some drum libraries are are so kind of complex with all the routing and like yeah that that it, it's like if I wanted to get into that, I just mic up my drums. If I wanted that Absolutely. amount of tweaking fiddliness, then I just mic up my drums. But um, but man, again, you have knocked it out of the park. Really, well oh, done. thank you. Really well done. Of course, we're gonna have links. We're going to have links to that as well as links to John's uh, other stuff, including Merge Production Music and Atomica Music and uh, links of other things that we talked about. But John, first of all, or, or last of all, because we're almost done, <laughs> uh, it's so good hanging out and chatting with you again, man. Uh, keep up the amazing work, what you're doing over at, his, at your YouTube channel. And again, go subscribe, folks. Go subscribe. But I really appreciate you joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh it's special for you to ask me to do this and I'm 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 grateful and I hope that uh everybody enjoys hearing what I have to say. Yeah. And if if you're interested in the sampling side of things, I'm thrilled to 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 announce that this isn't the last that the 52 Qs community is going to have a chance to interact with you and to be with you because on May 22nd, John is joining us for our May workshop and we are going to dig deeper into, into the sampling process. And are we going to have a chance to kind of see a little bit under the hood behind um, maybe soft, soft drums or anything like that? Or uh, Possibly. We could yeah. look at how that works. It, and, and, and that's part of the fact that it is a uh, contact library right. or not. You can kind of dig in and and make a few changes if you want. You better be right. careful. Don't don't mess it up. But yeah, don't don't brick could, it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I thought we would. Um, I'm still kind of working out some ideas. But you know, sampling it's not just so you can make something. And I have learned so much about how these instruments work because of sampling, and that yeah. only makes you understand how you can manipulate the instruments yourself when you understand how they're made. And so much of the difference I found is those little tweaks that make something feel like they fit in your track yeah. as opposed to here's a preset. And sometimes there you can go in there and just tweak those attack times, tweak those filters, tweak whatever, and you suddenly have a track that feels more cohesive. So, you know, it's it's there's not only do you get an instrument that's cool, you have an opportunity to get better at your craft. Well, it's just like anything, like you mentioned earlier, if you want to learn how an editor uses music, go edit some videos and try to edit your own music. You'll learn a lot about what does and doesn't work. Ugh. So learning to write your own or record your own sample libraries, it, you absolutely, you can learn what you can and can't do and how you can leverage what these sample libraries do. So, but that's coming up on May 22nd. It's going to be joining us over at 52 Qs. And uh, once again, John, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Once again, a huge word of thanks to John for joining me on today's episode. Of course, we're going to have links to his YouTube channel and to Soft Drums in the description. So you definitely want to check all of that out. And just to be clear, John hasn't paid me any kind of consideration fees. He didn't comp me any software. I mean, I plunked my money down for Soft Drums just like I believe you should. So just just go ahead and take care of that. You, you won't be sorry. Uh, so, and if you want to hear more from John, he's going to be joining us over in the 52 Qs community for a free webinar open to all community members on Monday, May 22nd at 5 p.m. Eastern, where he's going to be showing us behind the scenes two soft drums. He's going to show us the recording, uh, some, some of the, the recording, the isolated samples, how it's all put together in contact. So again, that is Monday, May 22nd, 2023 at 5 p.m. Eastern, open to all members of the 52 Qs community. So we're going to take a really quick break and hear from Mrs. 52 Qs, Shannon Croft, who's going to tell us all about how you can join the community. But when we return, we're going to be checking out a lo-fi cue written by the community member, Harley Toberman. Hey, y'all, I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52 Qs podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52Qs isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. 
It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52 Cues community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com. Right, that was Lo-Fi Mellow by Harley Toberman. Harley, thank you so much for sending this along. I, I think we've really nailed the, the harmonic progression of Lo-Fi, which usually is just one or two, or usually two chords, just kind of back and forth. And I think the form is working pretty well, but in general, I feel like the sounds could be considered considerably more lo-fi, right? It needs to sound kind of like an old dusty record. And uh, the piano It feels a little too bright. It feels like a felt piano, so I can hear kind of the foofy feltiness of it. And I've talked about that before. Um, but I think everything from, from kind of the, the brightness of the sound to the stereo, it, it feels pretty wide. And in, in general, it just feels a little too, too hi-fi for lo-fi. And, and, I, and I think the, the piano part itself, I think is working. If anything, it could probably probably be slowed down just a little bit, just the overall tempo. And by the way, I'm gonna uh, probably need to, to look at cleaning up the, the very, very front end of this. There's a little bit too much of an audio gap at the very, very beginning. 
So I, I think picking a, a, a piano sound, which is a little bit more, more lo-fi, and you can't go wrong with just kind of vinyl crackle and general um, lo-fi tape hiss, that kind of thing. And this is where a plugin like RC20 comes in really, really handy. And I'm totally flaking on who makes RC20. And let's see, let, let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug in an RC20 here just to see if we can't get it. And my apologies on, on forgetting who makes RC20. And, uh, and this isn't helping. <laughs> Uh, XLN Audio. XLN Audio makes RC20. So RC20 is uh, is my absolute go-to for creating kind of lo-fi vibe. And the, the first preset is called Vinyl One. And so let's just see what this sounds like. I'm gonna cut off some of the highs. We can kind of hear how. So, so here, here is here is the cue without RC twenty, and here it is with RC twenty. So we've added some vinyl crackle, some wobble, some magnetic wear, and some tube distortion. Without it, with it. And we can choose a different type of, uh, of, of noise if we wanted to make it sound like uh, tape hiss. That's kind of a low hum. And so that's, that's the, but the vinyl, here's another vinyl. Without it once again. And then finally, one more time with it. I like that vinyl one a little bit better. All right, so, uh, so I think in general, putting a plug in like RC20 is, is going to go a long way to lo fi ing your, your sounds. I don't think you necessarily need to dial up. A specific like a lo-fi piano sound because I think just throwing some effects onto the pianos that you already have instead of going out and buying other plugins. As far as the bass sound, the bass sound sounds like an electric bass. And I have found that much more rounder, almost like sine wave type basses, I think work a little bit better for lo-fi. And let's turn that RC20 here. Right. And so the flute, the flute is feeling a little, I think it needs to be quantized a little bit better. Probably drench it in a little bit more reverb. Like right in there, the quantization. Like boo, 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 boo. I think those need to be really solid. And, and, and once again, when the when the drums come in here, I, I, I think the patterns are working for us, but I think it's a, a sound choice type of a thing where where there's like a flange on it and the, the sounds just sound a little bit too bright. And so it needs to sound like old dusty cassette or vinyl, it's an old record. And so just some really simple you know, that type of, of, a, of a thing. Probably the kick pattern can be a little bit more uh, predictable. So it feels like more like a groove because lo-fi is, it comes out of more kind of the, the, the trip hop, acid jazz. It's, it's a flavor of hip hop really. And so we, I feel like we need a little bit more consistent groove, kick snare relationship, you know, that type of, type of a sound. Put RC20 back on. 
And I like the guitar choice here. Uh, guitar gets used quite a lot. Now let me turn off RC20. With RC20. Put a little bit more noise. Without without RC20. Yep, just a little a little bit too hi-fi. Probably go ahead and bring maybe some backbeats here. And then a little stop, stop, and then end. Yeah, I just feel like that that the assigned bass would fill up a little bit more of the bottom end here uh, because it feels just a little a little thin on that bottom end. This is why I love using sine wave basses for that. But Harley, thank you so much for sending this along. This was sent during our week 18 weekly feedback thread, and uh, we take uh, we take submissions and we open up this thread every single week. And uh, I will be pulling. A cue written during our week 19 submission. We are collecting cues right now. It's a fantastic place for you to post your cues, post uh, feedback for other cues. So why don't you join us? Why don't you join us over there? And if you found that feedback helpful and you would like feedback, feedback on your own cues where I unpack things like the mix, uh, structure, harmonic, harmonic business, melodic things, even titles and mastering, then uh, head over to 52cues.com slash coaching and uh, you can order up your own feedback video and while you're there you can check out my other uh, other coaching services including one-on-one -on -one zoom sessions and masterminds so definitely 52cues.com slash coaching but that is going to do it for me this week you definitely definitely want to join me next week where i will be unpacking ways that we as production music composers can apply the 80-20 or the Pareto principles to our careers. Different ways that we can maximize 80% of our results with only 20% of our inputs and 20% of our efforts. That's the Pareto principle and we're gonna be talking about it next week. So, uh, and then once again, a huge word of thanks to the family, friends and patrons of 52Qs who help keep all of this going. Please know that I love and appreciate every single one of you and without you, this would not at all be possible. But that's it for me. And yeah, I hope that you've had a fantastic week 18. And I know that your week 19 is going to be fantastic. How do I know that, friends? Because I know and believe that the universe has amazing plans just for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2023 at 18 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Cues.com.